It is a scene like nothing you could imagine. That's how Canadian nurse Amy Leah Potter is describing what she saw in Gaza over the one month that she was there with Doctors Without Borders. She was stationed primarily in Rafa and Khan Yunis, once considered the mandatory safe havens for civilians, both areas increasingly under threat. Amy is joining us now. Amy, good morning to you. Good morning. We know this week the UN is saying that famine is imminent and that it is increasingly difficult to get aid into the region, aid that would include medical supplies. Can you tell us what was the scene like in Khan Yunis and Rafa? What are the, the sounds and the smells and the sights that stay with you? But the first thing you see when you when you enter the area is the equivalent of so this is an area that held a few hundred thousand people and they had crammed 1.7 1.8 million people into the area it 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 was unbelievable. It was almost like a, a mosh pit at a at a concert. You couldn't move down the road hmm. some days. Every available building became a temporary shelter. I remember distinctly going to one wedding hall that held over 30 families, and outside was just tents, as, as far as you can see on every surface. And, and again, tents is a, a charitable term. They're often just pieces of wood loosely nailed together, covered in plastic that's absolutely no no match for it. Um, the winds and the rains that are, that are happening in the area there's a level of desperation that I wasn't prepared for uh, you had mentioned before about food becoming more and more scarce as resources were unable to get into the into the area people had no, were no longer able to cook and prepare food for themselves because they simply they couldn't either get food or the f little bit of food that was there they couldn't afford inflation was unbelievable prices are are 10 to 20 times what they were before the war and nobody has any source of income any longer um, so we would see lines getting longer and longer every day at um, ngo food distribution points you work mostly uh, out of a truck this is aimed at providing mobile aid to displaced people which is in the millions what did you observe while you were in the field so again, we all we talk a lot about the war wounded, which we did see uh, quite a bit of, especially in the in the facilities. But we were primarily focused on providing care for the population, and we call them internally displaced population that lived in the camps in the Rafa area, very close to the Egypt border, sort of seeking refuge, and. We would have people who hadn't seen a doctor since the war started. So things that we take for granted, like being able to get our blood pressure medications or our thyroid or diabetes medications, they didn't have them. Um, they'd been living without their medications. They'd been living without being able to see anybody for an ear infection or an eye infection or a urinary tract infection for weeks, if not months on end. So we set up um, out of trucks because finding a structure to work out of was so difficult. So we worked out of trucks just trying to provide um, just even just a little bit that that we could until we could move into a structure. Uh, and I, I, you had mentioned earlier about the sounds. One of the sounds that I, I will never forget is there is a constant whine, a high-pitched whine that you hear from surveillance drones 24 hours a day above you all the time. That's sort of like the almost the, the theme song of the area. Um, in addition to that, it's punctuated with explosions every single day from either tanks, boats, helicopters, trucks, gunshots being fired. It, you can never forget that there's a war going on. You can usually see the smoke on the horizon from the, the bombs in the nearby areas, or you can see the Navy out in the, in the Mediterranean. But the, the sounds of war never stop. The, the, the people who live there never get a break from it. One of the things that I remember from another doctor that we've spoken to is, is that about the sound. So there's that sound, but then there's also the sound of children because there's so many displaced people. There's no school. They're, you know, they're just living in temporary shelter. So they're out in the streets. Israel's saying it intends to attack Rafa, which was long considered the safe haven for these refugees. What will happen if an attack moves into that area? It's going to be catastrophic. I mean, there's no, there's no way around it. This is the last place they have left to go. And the kids in the streets, I see them every day. From the very early morning, I'd wake up, they're flying kites because there's nothing else to do. And these kites are made of garbage. They literally are making garbage kites and flying them. And it's, it's heartbreaking and heartwarming at the same time to see how resilient they are. But I remember speaking with one little boy, and he'd moved 10 times, and he told me, there's nowhere left to move. I don't know what to do. And we did have a couple of our um, staff members start to relocate back to the middle area, and I thought, well, maybe 
this will be where they can go. The middle area might be the new safe spot. And I was asking around and I was told, well, they're from the middle area and nowhere in Gaza is safe anymore. So if you're going to die, you might as well die at home. This is the depressing reality that they face. They, the only thing that will save them that they believe, and I agree with them, is a ceasefire. There's nowhere left to go. There's physically no more space left. And that decision is not being made by the people who are going to feel the impact of it the most. Amy Lee Potter, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this, be sure to subscribe here, or you can check out more Your Morning videos right here.